Well, today we are indeed privileged. This is indeed a good Friday because we not only have two giant brains, but there's a third giant <laughs> brain added to the mix today from all the way from Ottawa and Canada. Gabriel McCafferty. Gab McCaffrey. Very welcome, Gabriel. How are you? Very well, Jude. Good morning and good morning to Pat as well. Uh, good to see good you. Good morning, Gabriel. Good to see you. I hope you'll be able to talk some sense into uh, MacArthur now uh, uh, and <laughs> throw light on the issues of the day. Um, you've been living in, in Canada, in Ottawa, for decades. Uh, 35 years here, and uh, before that I was uh, 11 years in Dublin. So, like, I am a long time out of Belfast, but never lost the accent. And, of course, I go home every year or two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, it never, it's always a problem when you go abroad. You, you, you uh, miss some things about Ireland, but at the same time, there's some things about Canada you wouldn't want to miss either. Yeah. Uh, no, I, uh, by the way, I, Gable, I, 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 I was up in Leonard Kenny this morning, and uh -huh. as a young fella growing up, growing up, I remember Good Freddy, all the shops were shut, and no, being a good Catholic boy, I remember we used to have to go to Mass in the morning, and then there used to be a, a, a what do you call it, a sort of a procession, if I remember correctly, around the church and maybe even around the town in Leonard Kenny. I up this morning, you couldn't tell it's Good Freddy, everything's open, business and that traffic on the way in and whatever. What was your memories of Good Friday in Belfast before we started into the politics? Well, uh, I, I was brought up a uh, Catholic in Belfast uh, and um, I went to Christian Brothers. So Good Friday was very much a church going occasion. And uh, to, to add uh, insult to injury, uh, my mother uh, uh, helped me to become a, an altar boy. So I was an altar boy at St. Malachy's in Belfast. And so Good Friday was a busy working day for me. Uh, uh, there was furious uh, things going on in the church. Uh, the, the big one I remember is the 3 p.m. in the afternoon. And uh, the, yeah, gloom, yeah. The, doom, the doom and gloom around the day, because, of course, you know, in the Catholic tradition, it was a day that the, the, the Lord was crucified, but it was also yeah. called good, which I found it hard to understand as a yeah. child, because it was good for us because he, he saved the world. So yeah. there we go. Yeah, yeah. I, remember, I remember that religious ceremony in the afternoon, the one that started at three o'clock. As a young fellow, that used to go on for three hours. And but see, by the time you know, uh, you know, I'm not uh, people's face far from it. But see, by the time it was over, <laughs> good God, I remember thinking, uh, you know, not for me. Yeah, yeah, that always was a gloomy time indeed. Um, yeah. And in fact, there was very little on TV too. If you remember? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which is even yeah. worse. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, right, so are, let's move Friday, on. Things are better now, thank God. Okay, so we're going to talk about a few things, and the obvious one to talk about is um, the Assembly and the Executive, which are not in existence, despite the fact that Joe Biden is going to visit. And um, a lot of people are feeling a bit disillusioned. Uh, how does it seem to you, Gabriel, from your perspective abroad, uh, the success of what happened 25 years ago? Okay, well, uh, I'll preface my comments by just saying one thing, Jude, that uh, obviously uh, I'm not uh, as abreast of the minutiae of day-to-day -day events and all the individual players uh, as you and Pat would be. I do uh, keep up and I do think I have a better understanding than most of the Irish people I meet here, but uh, I certainly uh, don't pretend to have the expertise that, that you, you and Pat would have. From this perspective, uh, I know some Canadian politicians uh, here in, in, in Ottawa who have been back and forward to Ireland over the years. There's a, a, a body called the uh, Canada-Ireland Parliamentary Friendship Group and uh, comprised of about 30 or 40 people. Uh, they had actually a trip over to Belfast there in the, inside the last few months. And uh, I, I spoke to some of them and uh, uh, basically uh, I think they're well informed and they well understand that there's only one party in the assembly that's preventing the, preventing the normal function of an executive, uh, which is very, very uh, hurtful to the people of Northern Ireland because they don't have the uh, input uh, of local political representation to, to mm -hmm. alleviate some of the problems, uh, which I am aware of. Uh, Canadians uh, supported the Good Friday Agreement 25 years ago. I was here during that period. I watched it from afar. I watched it with a lot of interest and, and hope. Uh, I had grown up in Belfast through, uh, you know, I remember riots in 69. Uh, I lived uh, just off Great Victoria Street, and I remember mobs of PSVIs uh, being wound up in the Ulster Hall and charging through our streets and breaking the windows. So, I mean, I was introduced to the concept of uh, street violence very early. And uh, I left Belfast in uh, 77. I've seen a lot, uh, like, like 
like most people that we know, I'd lost friends, I'd lost family. So um, I wasn't untouched by the troubles. But Dublin for 11 years and then Canada it created a little distance, but never, never a distance in terms of hope or never a distance in terms of aspirations for something better. Good Friday brought that. Canada was very involved in it, as you know, with General de Chastelin mm -hmm. on the decommissioning. Uh, yeah. with J Judge Peter Curry, who went over there uh, and uh, did an investigation of collusion. As Canada has been very committed to supporting Good Friday, and I find that today, I, I do talk to some members of parliament here, here from time to time, uh, and uh, they're very supportive of the Good Friday Agreement, and they'd like to see it fully implemented. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a long way from being fully implemented at the moment. Uh, <clears throat> Pat, uh, look back on the Good Friday Agreement and tell me, Answer these questions, Pat, and you chip in, Gabriel, if you if you like it. Um, why did people vote for it, and do you think they've got what they voted for? Dude, uh, I heard somebody saying, uh, "Don't let the uh, the, uh, the sort of the perfect get in the way of the good." Mm. You know, uh, like there's. Richard, I wrote it down just because you know the way I, my ability to remember figures is about no. In 1972, if you get by the way, Jude, I looked it up the other day. Uh, the book Lost Lives, which is the, the definitive record of the yeah. Troubles. 1972, it runs from page 137 of deaths to 312. And there was in July of 1972, there was 100 people alone died. In 1973, it runs from three, page three, uh, 313 to 411. Jude, I worked it out. In those two years, 273 people alone died. Uh, you know, at, at least that, Judah, you know, I'm not, Judah, you know, I'm wrong. There's about 300 people died in 1972 alone. So, you, you're asking the question, why do we have the Good Friday Agreement? No, you know, the other day, uh, somebody said, uh, who, uh, Jerry Adams went on, uh, I think it was BBC, and he said that the troubles, uh, the IRA could have continued. And that was poo pooed by several people that the IRA were on. Jude, here's a simple thing. And here, I. I uh, the, uh, when the ceasefire broke down in 1994, the IRA was able to bring a bomb into uh, London, to Canary Wharf. They were able to bring a bomb in earlier on where they sent the martyr down to Downing Street. If this was an organisation that was on, a, on its knees, they were able to do a hell of a lot. So what I'm saying is that could have continued. So that wh why I'm saying the Good Friday Agreement had put an end to that. Mm -hmm. There were both sides, I think, got a very tired. There was a lot of deaths. And by the way, yeah, Seamus uh, Mallon said, what was it? The Good Friday Agreement was sunning deal for slow learners. And Jude, we should have had peace a long time earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, now, did, did sh a short answer to you. It hasn't delivered everything, Jude. The Good Friday Agreement, Belfast Agreement, what the hell do you want to call it? It hasn't delivered everything. But Jude, there's a, uh, somebody said the other day, and I don't remember who it was, said there are a lot of people alive today. Stephen Grimmison on BBC, that's what he said. And mm -hmm. That's where I remember it from. He says there are a lot of people walking the streets today who wouldn't be walking the streets today but for the Good Friday Agreement. And I yeah. agree 100% with that. Yeah, yeah. I, I think a lot of people, certainly in the South, and uh, a considerable number in the north as well voted for the Good Friday Agreement because they saw it as peace. That would have been the number one reason. And all the other things were sort of add-ons, but to uh, stop the bloodshed. And it did amazingly stop the bloodshed. And, um, uh, you know, we all have to be very grateful for that. However, um, I think a lot of people also voted for um, the notion of a referendum. At least if you talk to Republicans, they'll say, the reason we stopped um, the violent conflict was because we saw there's another way. And there yeah. hadn't been another way before this. And now we had it. Um, so they, not, not, some, people, some people, in a way, simply wanted not to have bloodshed. Others didn't want to have bloodshed and believed there was a hopeful future where uh, a vote could be taken at a border poll and it might be possible that Ireland could be reunited uh, peacefully. Um, yeah. We know that the bloodshed, by and large, by and large, has worked, the lack of bloodshed. Has the other leg of the stool um, worked, I wonder? Um, but what do you mean, Jude? Well, well, are there likely to be, is there likely to be a border poll? Do you see signs after 25 years of people really working hard to create the circumstances where a border poll could be, could be called? Yeah. I do, Jude. The demographic, Jude, let me repeat it for the... I don't uh, see them, Pat, well, I'll, I'll tell you, I don't see them. I, 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 well, uh, Jude, I do. 
because already the demographics do they, you know uh, right now everybody's concentrating in uh, the protocol and all the rest of it but once that settles down there four of the six counties are already a, a nationalist majority the demographics there are more now officially more nationalist catholics than there are protestants the Un belfast city council has gone nationalist they, there are more un or nationalist uh, types at Stormont uh, uh, than there are unionists the, the designated first minister, uh, should Starman return, will almost certainly be Sinn Féin. You tell me that all doesn't count? Well, but I'm talking about the referendum. Anyway, I don't want to hug it. Uh, but everybody Gabriel, set it Gabriel. up to you. That's, those are the facts, and you can't ignore them. Right now, everybody's constant. All the political, uh, what do you say, plunder is putting on this, get, trying to get the, over the line for the Windsor Agreement. But uh, can I, uh, can I uh, Judy, uh, following on from you, Gabriel, did you leave Belfast because of the troubles, or did you leave it for economic? Following on from Jude's question about uh, violence and what it delivered, did you leave, what did you leave for? Uh, I didn't leave. I didn't leave because of the troubles. I fell in love with a, a girl who was at university in Dublin, and uh, she had been out of Belfast for a few years and insisted that uh, if we were going to go forward, I'd have to come to Dublin. So uh, it wasn't wasn't much of a choice. <laughs> I I, no. I, mar I married her and I'm I'm still I'm still with her like uh, you know uh, 40, 45 years later. Uh, yeah, she la femme. <laughs> yeah, no, Sorry? but I say you know so, uh, like in Derry and Straban and places like that the trouble. So many people had emigrated. I always claimed if you went to the moon, you'd find a wee guy from Derry sitting having a pint of Guinness somewhere. You know, <laughs> like that had gone to that stage, and there was so much, so much. I think four out of the, I uh, remember, I think it was the Round Tree Foundation. I've always remembered this. The Round Tree Foundation did a, a survey or whatever you like to call it of the four or uh, the 10 poorest wards and quote unquote the British Isles. Four out of the 10 were in Northern Ireland. Mm. I think two of them were somewhere in the north of England and so on. Mm. And obviously, th that was the background. Somebody keeps asking why the trouble started. When there's poverty, when there's deprivation, when there's sectarianism, when there's bigotry, when you keep going and all the rest. And I listened to some of the commentary that last day, and I'm start starting to sound like Jerry Adams. I don't intend to be. Uh, but you know, wh what's the catalyst for trouble? If you create the sort of situations you know, whereby people feel they're d discriminated against, uh, there's, it's like a valve. Eventually, it'll blow. Well, just a, a quick addition to that, Pat. I was listening to Talkback. I'm sure you're familiar with it too, Gabriel. That Talkback show at uh, noon here, and somebody was saying this notion that people, uh, Michelle O'Neill, had said that there was no people didn't have a choice to uh, but to resort to violence, and he was very, very in fact, he, everybody had a choice. They had a choice. They had a choice. But I take your point. Um, for many people, for some people, it was a choice. For other people, you know, as you often said, if your dad was dragged by the hair downstairs or if your best yeah. friend was shot outside your door, you might see uh, <laughs> violence um, in a different light than you would if you're living in some leafy suburbs. But let's come back to the, the question of the Good Friday Agreement. Good Friday Agreements, I, I was looking at the, the detail of it uh, in anticipation of this. They set up, among other things, six north-south bodies. Yep. And these were to deal with health, education, agriculture, environment, energy, tourism, security. Do you think they have been thriving, active, and really uh, changing things over the last 25 years? I'll let Gabriel answer that. The only one of those bodies that I actually see or am experiencing in Canada is Tourism Ireland uh, operates on a 32 county basis and promotes the island on 32 county basis, which is actually, uh, you know, both pragmatic, logical, rational, and it's actually effective. I've met uh, the heads of Tourism Ireland here uh, out of New York and out of Dublin, and I've talked to them about this. And uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting uh, concept that there we have two uh, uh, different uh, uh, constitutional statelets, uh, and I call them both statelets, the northern statelet and the southern statelet, because- How dare you? What if um, I live in a, a free country. <laughs> you live in a country, Pat, eh? Yeah. <laughs> well, you, you can think you can think what you like, Pat, but uh, I am a Republican, and uh, until, <laughs> until that's, that's you, that's you and Collins on the one side. Until 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 there's a thirty until there's a thirty. I live in the unoccupied part of this country, Gable. You can describe it any other way. Now you like, go ahead. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to have to deal with this partitionist mindset. Okay, I, I, I can look at that. <laughs> the Tourism Ireland body, uh, which I have actually collaborated with on several social cultural functions here in Ottawa, which I've been involved in organising over 
over the years, mm. including uh, uh, whiskey uh, tasting, you know, uh, and the products of whiskey yeah. Uh, yeah. That, w- that we have uh, displayed in Ottawa uh, over the last four years uh, to a very wide and diverse audience, have included mm. products from all over the 32 counties of Ireland, and it's promoted as a Irish product, even says mm. it right on, right on the bottle that's produced in Bushmills. It's yeah. product, of, product of Ireland. And yeah. you know what? We're all products of Ireland. I, I like that. I like the branding. I like the way it works. Well said. But we yeah. could we could uh, take that concept and uh, do things in the future. And I think this is possible under the Good Friday Agreement if either of the governments had, had the notion to pursue it. Uh, we have coming over here to Canada and America the IDA, EI, and Invest Northern Ireland, and they're all plowing in the same furrow. And I really believe there should be one organization over here trying to represent Ireland as an attractive place for, for people to grow businesses and, 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 and provide employment and, and yeah. really good, good wages compared to what Northern Ireland has, which is one of the lowest lowest wages in, in, in the whole yeah. of the Britain yeah. and Ireland. But if you had yeah. one body, Gabriel, uh, I think unionists would see that as a diminution of their Britishness. <laughs> exactly. They'd see it as uh, setting us on the road to uh, Dublin and uh, United Ireland. Uh, I, I must say, uh, when you say that, uh, and it's true, we see on TV, Tourism Ireland, I don't think most people would say the tourism has been transformed here, or maybe we're not informed. Maybe tourism doesn't tell us enough about what they're doing. I see their ads every so often on TV, but they don't say, my God, tourism has been transformed, just like the roads in the South. But they've oh, really been transformed. Oh, I, 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 would be, I, I would beg to differ. I, I went to, um, and the troubles I used to regularly go up to Belfast, yeah. And you know, uh, you know the old joke of a first prize is a week in Belfast, second prize is two weeks. But right? you know, that, it's now now it's, it's changed. Dude, go up to Belfast and it's buzzing. And by the way, I was up in Ballycastle last year. Or, no, I'm sorry, it's two years before COVID. And the number of cars with Southern registrations I saw in Ballycastle was uh, unbelievable. Yeah. Right. And uh, you know, all that around that North Antrim coast. Cushioned all, cushioned done all around. But let me one other thing. Gabriel said something there that uh, about the one thing uh, that's uh, that's sort of uh, working was tourism. Do you realise, Gabriel, that on since Brexit, now if if someone comes from North America like you and you're a Canadian or American and you fly into Dublin and you go across the border, you will now need some sort of uh, sort of uh, official document and view, uh, to cross in because of Brexit. And if you now apparently they will not be stopping you at the border, but if you have an accident, that you're in sort of grey area about how much you're covered legally and all this sort of stuff. So I would presume in the next while there could be a lot of Americans, a lot of Canadians and people from continental Europe saying, oh no, we will not be crossing the border into the north of Ireland until this is sorted out. So there's another outworking of Brexit. Well, the, 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 problem, the problem there is on a couple of fronts. Uh, First of all, most people that, that I know of here, and I have a lot of American friends through my business life over 35 years uh, from coast to coast. And uh, many of them actually, uh, one of them in, in, in the last couple of weeks was in Ireland. When they go to Ireland, uh, many of them reach me and say, can I go to the north? Is it safe? And I tell, tell them, yeah, of course, yeah. you know, go and enjoy yourself. But they all see going to Ireland as an entry point through Dublin. Not, nobody yeah. goes to Ireland as an entry point through Belfast. In Belfast, yeah. It's, for, for, for one thing, there's no direct flights. And there are from, from there used to be, I think, but they're, they're not only in Dublin. I was afraid uh, of Belfast to America. Jim, yeah. by the way, you asked the question. I'll, I'll throw it back at you. Do you seriously think that um, economically there's a, you know, a cross borders working, the transport they're working, all the uh, waterways, even do you? Do you, uh, you said there were six. I think six bodies set up. Uh, six bodies. Uh, I, I, I think. I think I'll take uh, Gabriel's point that uh, tourism uh, has benefited considerably. Certainly, northern tourism. Yeah. Because it has been uh, Ireland's been marketed as one unit, um, yeah. and certainly it is true. Belfast is busting with people um, from abroad. Um, I think maybe we fail or somebody's failing or the politicians perhaps are failing to tell people this is a product of the Good Friday Agreement. This is why we have all these tourists. This is why business is booming in that respect. Uh, I think that isn't emphasized half enough and tied most tightly enough to the Good Friday Agreement. It's just Mm -hmm. people tend, tend to just accept it. Let me move on very quickly to health, education, agriculture, environment, energy and security. Now, all of those, I'm sure there's some work being done, but I don't see them as being A, clearly marketed or explained to people, 
or B, actually affecting, you know, striking change? No. No, but wasn't it Ray Bassett that said, you know, Ray Bassett, the former Irish ambassador to Canada, and plus he was one of the negotiators, people on the, on the team from the Republic uh, doing the Good Friday Agreement. Mm. He, he referred to a lot of those things as being put in cold storage, uh, that basically nothing was happening happening on them. So, they, and by the way, there was supposed to be legal uh, 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 stuff around all that, that it, they would be recognised and working. But no, nobody's ever done anything about it. Uh, but then, of course, to the other side of the story, the Dublin government doesn't want any prizes uh, for its attitude. It's done nothing to sort of push it. And like this, I keep sneering at this shared island thing from uh, Michal Martin. Uh, I, I I regard him as uh, uh, Fianna Fáil, the Republican Party. Uh, yeah, right, OK. But anyway, the bottom line of it all is, dude, the Dublin government hasn't pushed the Good Friday Agreement to the extent that it should have. Uh, and, and then, of course, Jude, um, I'm jumping around a place a wee bit, but I remember the famous one from George Osborne, the former chancellor, who said, thanks to Brexit, that uh, Dublin would become more of a, a, a centre for northern goods, you know, when Dublin being the south, uh, rather than London, and that the, the politics would follow. You know, the, the, the DUP sold its people a pub that Brexit would bring back the halcyon days of the 1950s for unionism. Mm -hmm. And look what's happening. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's uh, a couple of go couple ahead, of reasons. Uh, Gabriel. Yeah, you know, Pat makes a lot of very sound points. There's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, in terms of uh, unionism, I think unionism, uh, we're watching the end game of unionism on Ireland, which was an experiment from 1921-22, an experiment which is uh, slowly uh, fading away into history. And uh, we're in the end game, and we will watch that happen. The demographic changes that Pat talked about are very obvious. Uh, very obvious in the census, they're very obvious in the school attendance level, particularly at primary level. Uh, there, there, there is a sea change that has already uh, uh, happened and it is going to continue to accelerate. Now, that doesn't mean to say it's going to be smooth and uh, going to be without bumps. There are going to be bumps along the road. And unfortunately, some of those bumps may even be encouraged uh, disorder. And we can see some of that happening in mm. Belfast at the moment, which is not entirely uh, spontaneous. In terms of the Irish government, there were a lot of strands in the Good Friday Agreement that they, an Irish government should have stood over because it was one of the co-signatories and it has not, and it has not implemented and it has not pushed uh, the British Irish Intergovernmental Council, for instance, they stood back. Uh, they could have demanded as an equal partner that there be periodic uh, meetings of that council to discuss matters of uh, joint interest and to uh, seek to uphold the rights of nationalists in the North. They've never done that. And there are reasons for that. And those reasons must be very, very uh, uh, stated because uh, they're, they're crucial. And that is that the two parties, traditional parties of government in Dublin, Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael, are terrified of uh, greater unity in Ireland and of greater economic uh, and social and cultural, agricultural health union because it exposes their own ineptitude uh, for many decades. Yeah, well, that, that's understandable because we've talked about this before that, uh, I mean, it, it's not to their benefit to talk up the idea of having a border poll or affecting unity because that will really change uh, politics as it existed in the South for the last 100 years. And they're, they're quite happy with it at the moment, I think. But um, I was wondering if uh, we made a bad mistake, a very bad mistake, or, or rather the people who negotiated it made a bad mistake when they said, a border poll or referendum could be held whenever the British Secretary of State decided that it could be won by those mm. who wished for a united Ireland. Um, does that strike you? Well, well, Pat first, maybe quite briefly, and then Gabriel. Does that strike you as a sensible thing to do? Not particularly, but it was sufficiently woolly for both sides to sort of accept. I think that the unionists could never accept the idea that there would actually be, be a border poll you know, uh, that... They see uh, Northern Ireland as, as part of uh, the UK in perpetuity, mm. and it'd give uh, enough r wiggle room for Sinn Féin, Mar McGuinness and Adams to sort of say, well, look, you know someone, maybe it'll become inevitable if their demographics are going our way, uh, that any moral position would say, look, we, we can accept it. Mm. I, I presume mm. it was jumping over a hurdle and saying, right, we'll push the can or kick the can down the road to mm -hmm. mix metaphors. Uh, Gabriel, I was just wondering if, if the uh, in Canada you're getting this narrative, as they now say, about a middle group, sort of alliance officially or non non officially alliance 
of young people who don't care about the border and are quite happy the way things are. That's that's the message that's been preached here. And I'm wondering if it's gone filtering through to Canada. Uh, it's certainly filtering through to myself personally, to Canada. Uh, the MPs that I, I keep in touch with and talk to who have an interest in Ireland, uh, people like uh, James Maloney and some members of his, uh, his parliamentary committee, they are informed and understand uh, where the issues are, uh, some of the issues in terms of uh, participation in the assembly and so on. So I, I don't think that Canadians who are involved in politics and uh, who have an interest in Irish politics, I don't think they're unaware of some of the realities. I think Pat made a good point about the Good Friday Agreement getting over the line. There's a lot of constructive ambiguity there. The one about the Secretary of State, uh, yes, it defines that he alone has the right to call it, but even if that wasn't defined in, in, in the uh, uh, agreement paper, it would have been the reality anyway, because it's only going to happen when, when somebody high up in the in the British government decides it's time to call the poll. That is, uh, it's incumbent then on those of us who want that to happen and who believe the timing may be coming uh, to the right moment in terms of uh, support. It's incumbent upon us to push for that. And uh, that's part of what some of the members of the Irish community are doing in Canada. Uh, since Canada had had uh, participation in the Good Friday Agreement uh, in some sense, uh, pushing Canadian politicians to uh, demand that the two governments uphold uh, some of the content of the Good Friday Agreement, which after 25 years, you can hardly accuse nationalism of being impatient. <laughs> you know, 70, 75 years waiting for the Good Friday Agreement, then it, uh, it happened uh, with all its ambiguity. And now 25 years later, we're uh, asking the uh, modest question, how about us implementing one of the provisions? How, yeah. How's, how's that for an idea? Yeah. 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 Uh, go ahead, Pat. Do you, do you, um, no, do you, I was going to ask you the question. See, did you asked us the question. Do you think the Good Friday Agreement has worked? Um, I think it's worked uh, in terms of the big thing that most people wanted, peace. You know, less bloodshed. Yeah. And that certainly has worked by and large. It works spectacularly. I suppose, as Gabriel has suggested, the good for the um, referendum idea or the calling of a border poll, uh, you know, the, the British Secretary of State could be put in a position if there's enough voices calling authoritatively yeah, for it. That's the point. Have to, he or she would have to agree that it be held. But I still think it was a bad idea to do it. What I do think should be happening right now, though, is you, you, Gabriel, you've talked about, you know, people are, are pushing and talking to representatives and so on. I really am getting more and more impatient with general efforts, uh, supportive sounds for a border poll. I want to see specific work. I want to see a citizens assembly set up. I want to see politicians coming out and saying, I want this to happen, you know, and maybe say 10 years. If they don't think it's going to happen for another 50, get out there and say it. But there's, I think there's too much vague talk. I'm getting old and I want to see this happen. Well, there, there are several problems involved. Uh, uh, there's problems that uh, exist in Belfast, some in Dublin and, and, and some in London. I'll start in Dublin. The uh, status quo in Dublin, the Fianna Fáil Fine Gael, uh, do not want a border poll any sooner mm -hmm. than they can push it off. For the simple reasons, if it were to be successful, uh, the whole dynamic of politics in Ireland would change. You'd now have uh, the, I mean, the largest party of both parts of Ireland, if you had their vote together, would be Sinn Féin. Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael don't organise in the north. Uh, DUP, UUP uh, would probably find some solidarity in Fine Gael. Alliance uh, uh, might, might split uh, fundamentally because despite the fact that they say they're not a party that focuses on the constitution, they're very much are, I think, to most people seen as moderate unionists. Uh, you said earlier uh, about young Protestants uh, thinking differently and maybe more receptive to a border poll than their fathers or grandfathers, grandmothers. Well, I, no, I didn't say that, Gabriel. I, no, I said no. that the, 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 the image that's projected is that they don't really care. You yeah, know, well, Protestants my, and my, Catholic my, young people don't care. Pardon me, my interpretation, uh, uh, misinterpretation. Uh, but I do agree with you, and I've spoken to a lot of uh, uh, younger uh, people from a Protestant or Unionist background. I have friends in that community in Belfast, um, and um, they are thinking differently, and they are uh, opening uh, their minds in the context of the European Union, uh, particularly uh, to the idea 
of a different reality other than a partitioned island. Uh, one of them actually has published a, a book uh, in recent times, uh, Ben Collins, uh, Irish Unity. Uh, ben comes from a Protestant and Unionist background, and yet I think he speaks on behalf of a growing tendency within the uh, uh, community that he comes from of people being open-minded to the idea of a new Ireland within a, a European Union context. Uh, Brexit, I think, uh, was a, a great uh, di division, di division amongst people who were uh, totally unionist and who were moderately unionist. And, and I think we'll see more of that play out. Yeah, you see, yeah. That, that, I think that's an go. instance. Sorry, Pat, just a quick one. No, go ahead, um, I think that example of that, Ben Collins's book, uh, um, being, you know, from the point of view of a young or relatively young unionist in terms of a United Ireland. I didn't know about that. I mean, that kind of thing should have been somehow or another made more available, make people know about that. Uh, maybe there might have been structures where that voice could have been amplified. This is what irritates me, that there's things happening, but they're, they're not sort of coming together and using that uh, movement as effectively as they might yeah, there's a young girl, I don't remember her name. She was on uh, social media the other day. Apparently, her, her father is well known in the in political circles behind the scenes. And she said on the record that she, as far as she was concerned, Michelle O'Neill was talking a lot of sense in regard to what is currently going on. This wee girl said that it's ridiculous that uh, Northern Ireland, that the longest waiting helpless in Britain were in Northern Ireland. The poverty levels is. Uh, uh, as as Gabriel mentioned earlier, are way you know below the wage levels in uh, Britain, and you know food banks are on the on increase, increase strikes everywhere. That this place is just not working, and she thought Michelle O'Neill was speaking a lot of sense. Now, for somebody with a a, a, a sort of activist unionist background, to come out and say, Jude, I agree with Gabriel. There are, things are seemingly changing, uh, and uh, and the younger generation. So, are we saying? Are we agreed then? That the alliance, the notion of the alliances as a, a swelling, a big center block that actually is getting more powerful and which is agnostic about a border poll, doesn't care about it, will not work. Well, Steve, for Stephen Farry said on RT last night, I am not a unionist. Now, I don't know, don't know if that makes him a nationalist, but he says, I am not a unionist. Sorry, Gabriel, I'll let you go now. I agree with you about uh, Stephen Farry. I mean, I've been watching and listening to the man uh, over the last few years, and there's definitely a, a, a green tinge to his version of allianceism. Uh, there's also people in the Alliance Party who have perhaps a, 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 a light shade of orange tinge in, in their in their allianceism. Uh, for instance, like wearing wearing a dress made up of Union Jacks, that kind of, kind of thing, and being very front front row with the poppy on poppy day. And you know what? Uh, I respect both. Uh, of those parts of alliance, uh, you know, but the reality is you can only sit on a fence for so long and there will come a time where that fence will shake and you will have to fall down on one side of it or the other. And I believe actually that a lot of the young, uh, perhaps better educated, more affluent, uh, former unionist background people who are, are, are in alliance today, I think some of them are going to fall down on the side of a uh, united island within Europe. Mm. Can, can I make a, 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 a can, can ahead, I digress quickly? I was watching last night on the RT prime time, and mm. your own uh, what, Pen Gally, I can't remember her first name. Emma, she, on a, Emma Little Pen Gally, that's it. She had on a red jacket, a white blouse, and a blue pair of trousers. Beautiful. Now, she's she's going to turn around and say, <laughs> "Oh, there you go, make it." But I thought she was sending a non to subtle say by the way she was dressed. But anyway, that's a digression. Go ahead now, Jude. Sorry. Well, I, I do, well, that's good, maybe. That's, I've always said that, that every time a politician opens their mouths on any subject, it's with a view to their constituency and getting more votes. And yeah. every time they dress up, they also have the same thing in mind. Um, yeah. we're, we're running short of time, just about two minutes now. Joe um, Biden. I, here, here's, here's my question. Should the British government, the Irish government, the US government, the EU, Canada, should they be stressing to people in general, the advisability, the good sense of uh, United Ireland, or at least a border poll, and that that border poll is for a majority, not for a unionist majority, for a majority, that that's how it works with democracy. Do you think they should be striving for that more publicly? I'd like to see it uh, from uh, the government side, but uh, there are certainly uh, 
uh, people in the Irish community here in Canada, they're actively doing exactly what you uh, say and are meeting with politicians here uh, and uh, have a public campaign going on and asking for Canada to support uh, the Good Friday Agreement, particularly the provision for a border poll. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, the British Secretary of State was always going to have the power to call that, whether or not uh, it was mandated in words. Okay. And uh, so it's up to up to us who want it to make it happen by pressing for it uh, and encouraging others to press for it. Okay, Pat, very, very absolutely, uh, Jude. Well, look, Joe Biden's arriving this week. Uh, the, 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 look, let's line it up very quickly. The uh, the UK, uh, EU, USA, the Dublin government, just about everybody is in favour of the ones winter framework. The one group of people who are not are the DUP. Mm -hmm. Now, if they think that they're going to be that top of the tail that wags the rest of the dog, I say, grow up. I said that the um, Good Friday Agreement uh, was signed by many people for peace and also because they thought it was a peaceful way to achieve a united Ireland. Uh, you've just got five seconds each. Do you believe that you live to see a united Ireland, Pat? Yes. Gabriel? Within the next 10 years, confident. Okay. Thank you very much for adding an international note to our discussion <laughs> today, Gabriel. Uh, you're very welcome. I, I think it has upped the tone of things. No end. Pat hasn't sworn once. Have you, Pat? <laughs> I'm sorry, I missed that. <laughs> <laughs> good luck. Okay. All Gabriel, the best. Enjoy your good Friday. Good luck, yeah, yeah. Thank Good luck, guys. Bye bye. Okay. Bye. Thanks, Gabriel.